Have you got a great family story that you would like to get published? Getting published is important to preserving your family history forever. Think about how many times you found manuscripts and documents or letters in, say, a genealogy society journal. Well, you could be the author of one of those stories, and we're going to give you some tips on how to get published in a genealogy society journal in just a moment. Welcome to another episode on Genealogy TV. If this is the first time here, my name is Connie Knox. I am a lifelong genealogist here to help you go further, faster, and factually with your family research. Just a reminder, don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell so that you get notified each time we upload a video. So now, today we are talking with Diane Richard. She is the editor of the North Carolina Genealogical Society Journal. And she's got some tips for you about how you can submit an article for publication right now. Today we have Diane Richard. She is a genealogist out of uh, North Carolina, and she is here to help us understand a little bit about what we want to do if we want to submit an article uh, to a genealogical journal. So welcome to uh, Genealogy TV. Thank you, Connie. It's so nice to be here and um, share. As, as a journal editor, we love to have people offering material. Uh, as you can imagine, though, it's getting the right material that we're going to publish. Right. So a big part of it is each journal has their own requirements. So that's one thing to know up front. Are there formatting requirements? Um, is there a length requirement? Um, for me, a big thing, which gets, uh, we'll talk, I think, a little bit more about later is, is it a sourced document you're providing? You know, have you provided some references for what you're saying, or is this a family story that you're telling? Now, family stories can be acceptable to some journals if they're, they upfront it with a comment along the lines of, this is just meant to be clues, you know, please research this further and learn about it. Um, as an editor, I kind of focus on two things. I focus on data sources that are unique and interesting, that are not locally available, but are about local records. I do North Carolina Journal because it's great to get something from New Mexico's archive that's about North Carolinians because people don't think to look outside the state. And so I love, I will get people, they'll send me one little document that's about a North Carolinian. It's a great filler piece. It's great to put in and it's a resource people wouldn't have thought about. And I'd say the other big thing is really uh, family stories, but documented family stories um, because I can find data. I'm a researcher. I can find data. I can find abstractors. I can find transcribers. But what I can't do because my family is not from North Carolina is actually talk about North Carolinian families, as you well know, um, since you have uh, done an article for the journal about your family. That's something I can't bring to the table. But journals, a lot of journals are being edited by people like me who that's not even where our families are from, but we are editing the journal where we live. Well, we want those stories. We want the, the, I mean, I love reading those stories, the ones that just really get insight into a family, what times were like, um, and things along that line. Well, the great part about the journals, uh, especially for genealogists, is that uh, those stories are being preserved forever. Uh, when they are published in those journals, um, those journals are being archived uh, somewhere right oh, oh definitely I mean that's why I try to get these into the journal because it is a part of our preserving a heritage a lot of it's based on oral tradition and then people will then research it a bit so they provide some of that documentation to go with it and that's so rich because the documentation is never going to tell you that story Exactly. And then having the documentation with the story helps corroborate it. So future researchers aren't just going, well, that's hearsay or, you know, what did somebody say? They're getting that blend of both, that really personal history that is not documented with then some documentation to substantiate it. So when people uh, submit a story to you, do, do they have to have like the perfect uh, source citations attached to them? Uh, or no, actually, I, I'm I don't want, I'm fairly flexible because the way I look at it is. 
the content is key and other things can come. So I've actually worked with people who they've started out with no source citations, for example, Mm -hmm. and I'll say, okay, you need to now go back through this. Here's a few examples. And I need to know um, where this came from. You're making this statement about a death date. Where Mm -hmm. did you get it from? An obituary, a death certificate, the census, let me know. Right. And then the next iteration will be, okay, you've told me a little bit about it, but now is that enough that I can get back to it? So though there are all these systems in place, you know, you have Elizabeth Sean Mills with her methodology, you have the APA, you, I mean, a Chicago manual style, you have all these things. My rule of thumb is, as long as a source citation tells you something about how I can get to that same record. Mm-hmm. That's what that's what's most important. As a genealogist, you want to be able to recreate the trail to the source citation. And so I work with people and in the sense, and so I do try to work with people and say, you don't have to get perfect to me. If I have a question, I'm gonna get back to you. You know, if there's just something I've had people use the old IBID. And I can tell things got off and I just go, no, no, we don't do that anymore. Nowadays, you know, we don't use it, but please just re- keep repeating the same footnote um, if you can, things along that line. And that's actually where my proofreaders help me out a lot um, because they kind of keep me honest um, because I'll read an article in a certain way to put it in as an editor. And then I have a whole group of proofreaders who then look at it and go, this formatting is inconsistent. <laughs> Here's what you need to change. <laughs> and, 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 you know, so we're kind of a team when we're putting this together. So as long as you have that story there and, and you have some, I can tell that you have some um, documentation behind it, then we can work on it. I just can't, as an editor nowadays, you're not going to accept a story that's just a story um, or you're not going to accept something that is a um a very publicly available, often repeated piece of material Mm -hmm. because you don't want to publish something that uh, people can easily get elsewhere. So do journals pay uh, writers? Is there any compensation? Um, For the most part, and I can't speak for all journals, but every genealogy society journal I have um, worked with you might get offered an advertisement if it's one that's do that does advertising. You will you'll almost certainly probably get offered a copy of the journal issue. Okay, um, so, that your article appeared in because not all submissions have to be by a member of the society. So that's another nice thing. You can submit to a journal like you can submit to North Carolina because you have North Carolina ancestors. You don't have to be a member of NCGS. And I will get you a copy that, to kind of thank you for submitting it. Now, when you deal with some of the more magazine type uh, places, because I also write for um, Internet Genealogy, Your Genealogy Today, and things like that, then there, you do get paid for those types of articles. You know, if it's going into a commercial publication, you often get paid. If it's going into a nonprofit, it's typically you're doing it to have your name on the article and have it published type thing. Super, super. So last question on this. Uh, if if someone's going to get rejected completely from being published in the journal, what what examples might get them not? Um, okay, so one example would be it's something that I can easily see has been published elsewhere. Um, that, that would be one reason to be rejected. I mean, that it's literally, this is the fourth or fifth n- n- journal or, or it's widely published on a gen web page. We don't need to put it in the journal. People can easily get their hands on it already. Um, if it's something that's literally, for example, just a, trans, a transcription of a Rev War pension. Um, again, a Rev War pension that you can find on Fold 3 or you can find through the Southern Rev War pensions that have already been transcribed. Well, again, that's not adding anything to it. Now, if you were to take that Rev War pension and add in a lot of other details about that soldier's life or the family's life, that would be a different story. But if it's a a straight um, transcription, Um, if it comes across too much of a story, you know, so it's, it's, it's historical fiction. It's based on history, but there's, you can, you can 
does it have historical component the way it's written? Um, and I love reading historical fiction, but that's not what I want to put in a journal because a journal is to help researchers. And historical fiction is you weren't inside great grandpa's mind at the time when he was plucking the chickens type thing. So can, how can you speak to that? That's not something we do as genealogists or uh, researchers. Um, the other thing is no source information. You know, so it's not just that it's not a story. I can read pieces that look like they're very, very detailed, but there's literally not one source citation and the person doesn't want to add them. Well, I'm going to reject it because I'm not going to add them um, to it. And then uh, one other reason is you a single person keeps submitting too many pieces to a journal. I need to okay. reflect diversity, time, okay. space, um, topics, et cetera. So I can't keep doing one person's family and basically become their personal poem in a way. So I've, I've had to create a rule with some people and just say, come back to me in two years. And then oh, wow. I'll okay. consider inserting because there's um, a, not a lot of space in a journal and you start looking at it at a certain point and start having detailed articles and, and all that material, mm -hmm. it goes pretty quickly. Um, so that would be a reason for rejection is you're, you're just becoming a, a too much of a repeated author um, without um, hitting some new dimension. You know, you had um, uh, published one of my articles and, and I, one of the points that I wanted to make to our audience, that particular article was about a little girl named Fanny Knox out of Tarboro, North Carolina. And uh, she died in the, um, the uh, flu epidemic of 1918. And the reason, one of the reasons why I wanted to um, get that one published was because, well, first of all, it started with a cousin bringing me some little artifacts of hers. And I'm like, at first I thought, okay, she died really young. This really tragic, but you know, what am I gonna do with this little diary? And you know, and then I started, my imagination started going, right? And I'm like, oh, wait a minute, there's a story here. Not only is there a story about uh, the epidemic, but about preserving and honoring this little girl who died so young. And uh, so, you know, I didn't want her to be forgotten, you know? so. Uh, to the viewers, you know, keep that in mind that if you come up with little artifacts, they can they can become great little stories. Uh, so, Diane, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to tell us about submitting to genealogical journals. Thank you so much. No, thank you. OK, dig out those artifacts and stories and submit them to the journal that's appropriate for your article. Include pictures if you have them. That really helps make those articles sing. Hey, it doesn't have to be a novel. It can be just a few paragraphs or a couple pages. Don't forget to include your sources and check your facts for accuracy to preserve your family history forever. I hope you like this video. Share it. Encourage others to get out there and write their story. Now, you get out there and write your story. You can do this. I know you can. Until next time, thanks for watching Genealogy TV.